Well, welcome. Uh, I'm Greg Barsby. I'm the uh, Managing Director of Kinetic in Australia, and I'm really pleased to welcome you here to our National Science Week event, Female Game Changers and Change Makers. Do I need to click this? I think so. There you go. As a global science and engineering company, National Science Week provides the opportunity for Kinetic to celebrate and support the development of science, technology, engineering and mathematics excellence. It's fantastic to be able to host this event with the University of Melbourne during their Science Festival and to bring you some inspirational female STEM leaders from across academia, government and industry. By celebrating the outstanding achievements of women in STEM and hosting a discussion on what is shaping the future for science and engineering careers, we hope to inspire those of you in the audience tonight who are considering a, a rewarding career in STEM. Here to facilitate tonight's event, please welcome Dr Georgina Such from the University of Melbourne. Dr Such completed her PhD in 2006 from the University of New South Wales. After her PhD, Dr Such commenced postdoctoral work in the Nanostructured Interfaces and Materials Science Group. In 2013, she commenced a future fellowship in the School of Chemistry here at the University of Melbourne, enabling her, her to start her own research group in the area of stimuli responsive materials. I think you worked in all these places to really test my pronunciation. <laughs> Dr Such is now a senior lecturer at the University of Melbourne and has authored more than 60 peer-reviewed publications, including three book chapters. Dr Such also plays a, an active role on both the Faculty of Science Diversity and Inclusion Committee and the Women in Science Network. Please join me in welcoming Dr Such. Um, I first want to start by adding, um, as um, on behalf of University of Melbourne, your, my, our welcome uh, for joining us as part of the Science Festival. And from my perspective, the week uh, of Science Festival has been so exciting. There's been such a buzz around science this week. Uh, in chemistry, we've done a whole diverse range of things. We've, you know, we've used liquid nitrogen to make ice cream which is, you know, there's a fair bit of uh, science about that, but it's also young, so that, that's an advantage. Uh, we've engaged the first years by um, talking about the two minutes with each of the different researchers talking about their research projects. So that's be allowed us to not only realise that science goes beyond what they learn to actually be much broader, and we've got so many exciting directions they can go in. And so it's so exciting to be able to celebrate science and ex celebrate where we can go with it. But we have to realise that it's not, it's not all great. I mean, we know that for some parts of the population, they don't have as much access to science as we might like them to. So we need to, still, we need to also have that communication. We need to talk about that. And we do that also. We've done that as part of our uh, Science Festival Week, and we're doing that again here today. We need uh, females, not only from, you know, from primary school, school, but all the way up to be engaged and to feel that they can participate in science and, and, and make a difference in technology. And to, tonight we have three really interesting and inspirational women who are going to talk to us about their perspective of women in STEM. And then after they've given us a little bit of insight, we're then going to have a panel discussion where we're going to have some questions from the audience that we've already had uh, given to us firstly about some of the questions that you have about how we can engage more uh, half of the population in science. But also you'll have the opportunity to feed more questions as we go through as well. And we really encourage you to do that. We want to have a great discussion uh, about this area, which we need solutions in. We want everyone involved in science because it's a great place to be, right? Uh, so let me start with uh, introducing our first speaker for this evening, and that is Danielle Kennedy. She did her PhD at UNSW uh, and graduated in 2007. She then went to CSIRO and joined what is now manufacturing. She, so she did a postdoctoral fellowship there first and, th and then became a research scientist there and then moved up the levels. Uh, and she's now a leader of the Active Integrated Matter Future Sciences Platform. That's referred to as AIM, 
and their role is to identify advances at the intersection between materials, physical processing, sensors, robotics, inform informatics and information systems. So please welcome to the stage uh, Daniel Kennedy and she's going to be talking to us about two stories of structure and function, Rosalind Franklin and Daniel Kennedy. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to step away from the lectern and just check this is working. Can you hear me well? Great. Um, so when I was looking at game changers and change makers, I did want to talk to you about one unknown person from history, Rosalind Franklin, or if she's not, if she is known to you, she doesn't have enough recognition in my uh, opinion. And I'm going to weave throughout the presentation today why I've picked her in particular, because it's also a personal choice. Um, feel free to tweet pictures, um, anything you want during my talk. You can see my Twitter handle, DF Kennedy, at the bottom. Um, really more than happy for you to do that. So Rosalind Franklin um, is best described as a crystallographer. Um, you might have come across that word, but it means uh, it's a technique that uses x-rays to interrogate the structure of matter. Um, she had a rudimentary lab pictured there in, uh, in the middle of the screen in King's College in London for a part of her time where she obtained the now infamous photo 51. I'm not going to tell you exactly what that is right now, but it's going to be important later in the presentation. She also spent a really long time during uh, World War II focused on the structure of carbon. This was really important in the time as it was integral in the breathing apparatus that were designed to protect people from noxious gases that they encountered during war World War II. And, and she's world renowned for this work, but infamous for that photo 51 that we're going to get to. You heard um, some of our stories, and we always talk about things when we're writing our biography in very academic ways, that we went to this university and we studied for this long, and then we got this job and that job. And what I wanted to start with was a little bit of a personal story of my studies at UNSW doing a PhD. It takes a long time. And there's life along the way. And I came from a really great group under Professor Barbara Messley. And you can see she had a really diverse and growing group at the time that I was there. I was there for five years, a little bit longer than normal, predominantly because I had two children, one who was three when I started in 2003, and the other right at the end, um, just as I graduated. Um, and they're really important to my story, and I wanted to share that with you tonight. Um, we also had a fish. Its name was Hydrogen. We wanted to see if we kept naming, because I'm a chemist, we kept naming them how far through the periodic table we would get. But Hydrogen lasted a really long time in that conical flask. It's quite large, so it's the size of a normal fish tank. But why do I choose Rosalind Franklin? Because right at the most formative year, probably, of my education, I read this book called The Double Helix. It was the 50th year anniversary of the award of a Nobel Prize I'm going to talk about in a minute. And when I read it, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know that Rosalind Franklin wasn't known. I didn't know the controversy. All I knew at the end of reading that book was I was very unhappy with the way um, Professor Watson described Rosalind Franklin in that book. And it's actually a very controversial book. I'm going to talk about why. Around the same time, Nature published this 50-year perspective, and I found that on reading the book, so I found it after I'd finished the book. And yeah, there's a big controversy around what happened in, with the award of the Nobel Prize for DNA. Um, the other thing you would have noticed in our biographies is that we trade a lot in kudos. It's not like other professions where you get a job and someone wants to hire you because they want you to do another job and you are good for that job and you move on, you actually have to count this kudos up. In the background, that's my current CV. You'll see there's one page of stuff about me and then there's this big long list of every presentation I've given and every paper that I've written and what their impact factor is and how many people have read them and the number of citations. And we're not going to go into whether I think that's a good system, but we trade in this kudos and we get our next appointments because of it. 
And so the ultimate kudos is this lump of metal here in the middle of the slide, the Nobel Prize. And so today is the story of Rosalind Flanken and her now known but unrecognised role in the discovery of the molecular structure of DNA. So let's look back, April 1953, three side by side papers in Nature. They might be nondescript and the titles, you might not understand what they mean, but these is unheard of. Three non-peer reviewed, side by side publications of the same concept. The first by Watson and Crick, which really has a drawing, it's just a drawing, a conceptual framework for what the structure of DNA might be. The next by Wilkin, Stokes and Wilson. Stokes and Wilson also were never named. They were the students of Wilkins. And he has this fuzzy image, which is actually a diffractogram of the X-rays shown on um, DNA extracted from sperm. It's really fuzzy. If one of my students showed me that picture, I would say, go away and collect another image. What you'll see in the next one is again an image, this time with much more information. It's very rich. And this paper is published by Franklin and Gosling. Gosling was Rosalind Franklin's student. So how did this come to be? How did these three papers, not peer reviewed, end up side by side in nature? The next question I want to ask is 1962, when the Nobel Prize is awarded. It's awarded to Crick, Watson and Wilkins. Where's Rosalind? Unfortunately, even um, by this time, Rosalind Franklin had died. At the age of 38, due to her work with x-rays, she contracted cancer and had passed away. So you could leave it at that. You could say she was ineligible for the Nobel Prize because she was no longer alive. But why? Why is her name not even in the citation? I, s I spent some time in the lead up to this presentation trying to unpick it. Because whilst I'd read that book by Watson, I didn't really know why she'd been scooped and shafted in this way. But let's look at it a little bit. During the war, she spent some time in an institution that's not unlike CSIRO, um, a government laboratory studying coal. It sounds boring, but it led to the development of breathing apparatus that saves countless lives. She then moved to King's College London, where while she didn't have a PhD, she had, was a senior research scientist and imported, uh, appointed into a, a, a lead role. In 1952, uh, Gosling helped her take this image. So the student actually came up with a way of collecting the sample and mounting it. And so he was pivotal in this image, infamous picture 51. And she'd identified that there were actually two forms of DNA crystal structure, the A form and the B form. And the B form was dry and the A form was wet. And they're usually together and that's why no one had solved the structure because everyone was looking at this fuzzy mess of the two forms overlap. So she has two very clear pictures. Picture 51 is the wet form. And so that's the form of our native DNA in its active environment. She wasn't interested in this though at the time, the dry form was much more interesting to her because it was more crystalline and had more information in that picture. And so she was focused on that. So she gave picture 51 to her colleague, Morris Wilkins, who worked down the hallway. And they didn't have a good relationship. And he was really jealous of Rosalind, apparently, if you trust the historic record that's now been developed. And so when a young, very young, James Watson came to visit him, visit him, he actually gave him Rosalind Franklin's image, photo 51. And this was pivotal because whilst there was a race to discover the um, structure of DNA, Watson and Crick were on the wrong track. They had all the wrong spacings. They didn't know the distances between the base pairs. And it was this image that gave them the information they needed. And they developed a model and actually Rosalind saw that model and said, yeah, you've got it. 
And histori historians have looked at her lab books because that, she was also on that track. She'd written in her notebook months before, but she was doing the hard maths and she was a perfectionist, so she was not ready to publish at that time. So then there was this race, and there's a long story that I don't have time to tell you, but it's really interesting how those three papers came to be side by side because Watson and Crick tried to scoop her. They heard about it through the old boys' network. Wilkins got his paper put in, and then Wilson fought. She fought hard to have her paper in that issue. Um, she, they went on to complete her mathematical proof, and so she did have the first empirical evidence that gave proof of the double helix structure of DNA. She moved, though, because after what happened between her and Wilkins, she couldn't take it there anymore and she left. She trained and worked alongside Aaron Klug in the structure of viruses, and he later also won the Nobel Prize after her death off the back of that work and her training. So she's extremely influential, um, particularly in providing us methods, techniques, for understanding and interrogating the structure of biological molecules. As I said, she died of cancer, unfortunately, at a very young age, around my age right now. Um, and so the more I dug into her story, I started to see the connections that, I don't know if it's because I read that book and she influenced my career, or if I'm seeing the connections now because I'm looking for them, but I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on that after I close off this story. So let's come back to these papers. As I said, there was no peer review. And there's also some controversial things in the acknowledgements that Wilkins and, um, sorry, that Watson and Crick never acknowledged that they got her picture and that they used that to calculate their structure. Whilst Franklin was ever the, the um, I would say gentleman, actually I want you say that, I want to say that she was um, very, profound that she is reported never to have felt bitter, never to have felt angry. And this is a quote from her student Gosling, that she didn't use the word scooped. What she actually said was, we all stand on each other's shoulders. And I think that's very admirable and you should take into any career in science that you're going to stand on the shoulders of your colleagues. This is the picture of her proof. And so she painstakingly hand drawed the contours off of this image, mathematically proving the structure and actually refining their model, optimizing it for the distances between the pairs. So why did he write this conflicting account? Why did he not simply acknowledge her contribution? These are still hanging questions that I don't know that James Watson ever answered. So perhaps she was an obvious choice someone that you might have thought, yeah, yeah, we're going to choose her. Um, but take a look at her equipment. Take a look at the picture that she took and the studies that she makes. We're roughly the same age. And this is my work. I spent my postdoctoral fellowship many, many days in the synchrotron hutch using the small angle X-ray scattering to, dis to ascertain the structure of pro what's called proteokinetic liquids. So they're a salt, but they're liquid, and they have structures, so they're not, they're not all the same, like it's, it's, without going into the details. They have structure. It looks something like this. I'm going to take this time to acknowledge my collaborators. <laughs> um, Dr. Tamar Greaves, who was at CSIRO for many years, and I published a large number of papers, and it's a very productive collaboration. We have a collaboration with East China University of Science and Technology, so we have reciprocal exchanges and students come back and forth. And look at the technology I get to use. How great is it? I don't get stuck with one picture that I have to hand draw. We have computers today that do all of that, and so we invest all of our time in the science questions. Um, we have students who work with us, and this is the work of a student, Renata Lippi, who's just graduated, and her supervisors, Christian Junin and Chris Sumby from the University of Adelaide. And this is an X-ray diffractogram of this nanoparticulate structure, and it's really active, and we didn't know why. And so she painstakingly identified that there was this gap in our model, which is the blue line, 
sorry, the red line. Um, and we didn't identify it until we saw this picture. So that's our picture 51, photo 51. She went back and improved the model and we found the missing piece of the puzzle that we were looking for, in this case, the ruthenium in our structure. We couldn't find it. So even today, we use these techniques and we apply them, whether it's understanding the structure of the liquid, understanding and identifying new catalysts and nanomaterials. And so this is why I chose Rosalind Franklin. Today, my job has a big title, Active Integrated Matter. But what it means is that we're bringing together physical technologies with digital technologies. So I look after a really large platform right now. And how lucky am I that unlike Rosalind Franklin, I get to lead an initiative, I get to take the credit for what we're doing, and I get to stand out there and um, make a difference with my work. Just leave you with this reminder that science is a team sport, we don't do it alone. And I want to acknowledge all of my collaborators over the past 15 years. Thank you. Thanks so much, Daniel. That was so interesting, and I've got to admit that I didn't know that story, and it was really inspiring to, to hear it and to understand, you know. Things are complicated. <laughs> Hopefully we don't have that in the future. Uh, so that leads me to introduce my next speaker, which is Associate Professor Regina Kameri. And she did her undergrad at the University of Technology in Sydney in biomedical science and then went on to do her PhD in exercise science in the University of Sydney. She then went on to do, went on to do a long postdoc at Copenhagen Muscle Research Centre, which is a very um, important place to work. And she's then spent a number of years at the Defence Science and Technology Group, 13 years. So she's been there a while and she's working on um, health and human performance and injury of deployed soldiers. Recently, she's been involved in developing Air 4. And, she, and I won't tell you about that. It's a very interesting program, but she's going to uh, do the honours and tell us all about that. Thank you, Regina. OK, hang on. We need to switch over. OK. Thank you so much. Wow, I'm not sure how you follow that, but I'm going to try. <laughs> I, I've got my uh, interpretive dance just in case I fail. Whew. So, um, my title is You've Got to See It to Be It, and, and it's not just something, it's a title, it's something I truly believe in. And I'm going to make this a far more personal story about the people that have, be, have been involved in my life and have impacted my life. And this here is Dr Janice Cocking, and I'd like to say she's an alumni of the University of Melbourne and also a notable alumni. She completed a, PhD, a, a degree in metallurgy from this wonderful institution and she began her work straight after that at Defence Science and Technology Organisation at the time, but now group. And she worked, and I have to read this because I'll get it wrong and someone here in metallurgy will go, that's terribly wrong. <laughs> in high temperature alloys to develop a new type of thermocouple. And this is already used and, and routine, routinely used now for high temperature uh, measurements in many applications worldwide. Following the defects that were found in the Collin class submarines during their testing straight after they were developed, um, you might know that there were a few federal ministers quite critical of this uh, Collins class submarine, but Janice was asked to come in and lead the fast track a program that really remedied these problems that were not as serious as, as federal parliament would have you believe. Because she was so successful in that program, she's also been uh, instrumental in overviewing both the design and, and the production uh, requirements for the new submarines, which is part of that $1.6 million, a billion dollar spend that the federal government announced in defence infrastructure in 2015. From 2006 to 2015, Janice was the first and only Chief of Division at DST Group. And I can assure you it's a fairly, or has been until the last few years, a fairly male-dominated ecosystem. So good was she at her job that three of the seven chiefs are now female, and I think that's almost gender parity. So she really was a wonderful, fearless and inspirational leader that I really want to say kept her femininity. She was a female even though she was a strong leader and I think that is really about her personality and being that matriarch. And she really was the matriarch for DST Group. 
She's a trailblazer and she's led a path that so many of us in the females, uh, females in the defence science uh, organisation really want to aspire to. In her last position, uh, Janice was the chief of the science strategy and program division. I've got to get these right or DST people will come back and haunt me. And she's really led the uh, Next Generation Technology Fund, which is a $730 million spend that Defence has announced over the next 10 years, defend, uh, exploring defence capabilities. So she hasn't had small jobs at all. She's been uh, recognised nationally and internationally. She's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering. And wonderfully this year, she won the Public Service Medal for 40 years service on the Queen's Birthday Honours List. She retired this month from DST Group and she's going to be sorely missed. Here's someone a little bit different, but has had an impact on me in a different way. This is Professor Ma Ma Maria Fiatoroni Singh. She's a geriatrician who came to Australia from the US in 1999 to research in clinical exercise and nutrition sciences for lifespan. So really uh, working in that elderly population. She's published widely, you know, hundreds of papers, research books, the whole bit. She, in 1999, took over the John Sutton uh, Chair of Exercise and Sports Science and she works in the medical faculty there as a professor. Importantly to me, she's the mother of six children. So not only highly accomplished, but a mother as well. And I, I haven't asked her if I can tell this story, but I'm going to anyway, so it's probably going to get back to her and I'll get a nasty email tomorrow. But many years ago, during my PhD, she asked me to come and work with her taking a biopsy from an elderly patient. Maria was always on time, always impeccably dressed, very professional in everything she did. This one day, she came screaming into the laboratory looking very flustered. And I said to her, Maria, Maria, are you all right? She said, let's just get this biopsy done. Because we had an 80-year-old there. We we're trying to get a muscle biopsy from a leg, which we did. We sent this wonderful lady off on her way. And I said to Maria, are you, are you all right? She said, oh, I got pulled over by a policeman coming here. And I've gone, oh, that's a, bit, that's a bit wrong. I said, well, what happened? She said, oh, well, I had to drop the child at daycare, the baby, and I had, didn't have enough breast milk. So I'm breastfeeding, <laughs> pumping on the way driving 100 kilometres an hour. I'm going, OK, good for you then. It's run with me for many years, and you'll hear why. This is my personal story. I want to show people what a nurturing environment can provide, and that we are not defined by those that precede us, but by what they can provide to us in what capacity they are. So this gorgeous person here is my man, Dolly Graham. Interestingly enough, it took me till I was about 25 to realise her first name wasn't Dolly at all, but that's another story. <laughs> Dolly was five foot three inches or 160 centimetres. She lived in a small country town called Geary, which is 28 kilometres out of Dubbo, with about a population of 200. And she did what all women did during the war years. She survived. She brought up two women, wonderful women, the eldest being my mum. And really, she didn't have much. They really didn't do much. But she inspired my, my mother's generation to look beyond what was possible and particularly what the war years had brought. She died at 92, having lived in Geary her whole life, with a toilet as an outhouse even in 2001. So she had it pretty tough, dear Nan, but she was an inspiration and I loved her dearly. The next person here, and if Mum finds out that I put her photo up here in, in the lecture hall, I'm really in trouble when I do get home. Mum's slightly taller. She's 5'5", 165 centimetres. She had a basic ed level of education, finishing in year 10. She had to travel 28 kilometres, which doesn't sound like much, but back then from Geary to Dubbo every day of her life during her senior years. And really, once year 10 was done, she was done and then had to go off. And ultimately, her job was to get married and have children. Got to say, she was pretty good at that because I'm one of six. Mum didn't have much formal education, but she could clothe, she could feed, and she educated all six of us with not much money coming in through the door. And we travelled all over Australia. Now, after we all left the nest, Mum actually went and found a job as an archivist and spent 15 years before she retired having a really fulfilling career. And I do wonder what her potential would have been had she been educated and had she had the potential to see where she could have gone, or maybe it wouldn't have been different. 
But it's interesting that when she actually could go and develop her own skills, she found something truly inspiring to herself. And now to me, the chick from Dubbo. Stay-at-home mum, a dad who was a builder, who really, um, and again, we didn't have a lot of money growing up, but my career, my, my journey today starts in year 10. And this is gonna tell you how poor a student I was. End of year 10, with choosing our year 11 and 12 subjects, and I got the letter home from school to say I really should go and do an arts pathway. <laughs> there, um, if anyone's seen the words that I've written down for this speech tonight, it's not really my thing. Mum and Dad marched up to the school and said she's going to do science and she's going to you know, pass or fail regardless, so let her do it, the subjects she wants to do. And so the school relented and I'm glad to say I did manage to get a degree in biomedical science and I did manage to do a PhD and it's probably in spite of them rather than because of them. And I've not done so because I'm smart, clearly, but I've done so because I had families, mentors and some of my wonderful group of women and men who have supported me throughout my whole career. And to this, my darling five children. Yep, they're all mine, and I guarantee you that sometimes I try and avoid all of them at any given time. There is no perfection that can be achieved by these five children but survival. I walked into the kitchen this morning, and as my darling, he's now seven, as my darling seven-year-old was very proudly preparing his breakfast, I said, oh, darling, good on you, you're preparing, oh, sorry, lunch. He said, yeah, mum, I've prepared lunch. I went, oh. Pat on the back, proud mother, independent child, he's blurred gender lines, you know, the woman doesn't make lunch, he makes his own and we're all good. Never ask the next question. What did you make, honey? A fairy bread sandwich. <laughs> so I walked away just going, don't, don't, don't undo the good work, don't undo the good work. But surely his teacher now thinks that I'm a sugar junkie and I now have to book a dentist appointment for him. So I'm not going to make mother of the year, but you cope. And so my point is that I come back to that story of Professor Maria for Taroni Singh, who didn't always get it right, but she has and still has a fabulous career. My career is not quite so fabulous, but I've got a great family as well, and I wouldn't want it any other way. And so finally, because of others' belief in me and my ability to see the possible, I've founded, founded and, and starting to direct a program called Air4, which is aiming for impactful results. It's funded by DST Group, it's funded by the RAF, um, RMIT and DSI at the moment, and it's really about giving our young girls, regardless of where they come from, who they are, what their background is, the opportunity to seek new horizons. At the end of this month, we'll go live with this program, and it's really about bringing our junior girls and boys, but particularly our junior girls from grade four onwards, into seeking the possible. And so if there's anyone out there who'd like to join our program, become a mentor, a benefactor, I, I'm not adverse to taking cash from anyone, so please feel free. Did I say that? Cash is fine, just throw it down. Or if there's any other way that you would like to help us, we're going live in November this year, and I would like to show, particularly those girls from the lower socioeconomic backgrounds, and I've had that lived experience, our girls who are you know, first gen generation in Australia and are in a beautiful Indigenous girls, that you can be whoever you desire to be, as long as you put in a bit of hard work and you have those mentoring groups surrounding you. My final plug, and I notice Rachel's in the audience, so I better do it, is this wonderful program here, the APR Intern Program. If you're a late stage PhD student and you're looking for something to do, this program, I swear, is for you. It's working with women and men, but let's go with the women because it's all about us today. It's working with women to go into industry and work on discrete problems at the end of their PhD candidature. It's a great way of investigating what industry has to offer and there is a desperate need, particularly in the Australian uh, industry ecosystem, for more women to take charge of that. So if you're in that, Rachel, wave your hand, Rachel. Rachel's up there, go and see her at the end. It really is a wonderful, wonderful program and I espouse it everywhere I go. You get paid for it too, so what else? How can you go wrong with that? I'm finally going to leave you with a quote from our first female Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. Gillard finished the book pondering this thought. The perceived image and side of power was the king. And if women ended up with authority, 
Either she ended up being made a Madonna figure or a she-wolf, a self-seeking, hard-grasping, immoral woman. But it's a myth that wolves howl at the moon. In truth, when they howl, they are calling to their pack. Thank you so much. Thanks, Regina. Another really inspirational talk. And I mean, you really highlighted so many inspirational women working in STEM already. And some of your children maybe will join us one day. <laughs> Anyway, um, I think that's, it's really important to you know, keep, we've got the highlight coming through in both the talks that science is a team sport, right? And we need to always remember that. And our final speaker uh, tonight is Air Vice Marshal, Margaret Stabe. She was recently the CEO, CEO of Air Services after spending three decades in the Royal Australian Air Force. So we, as you can see, we've got a pretty diverse range of uh, expertise in this panel tonight. Uh, so she's had a number of awards, like she had in 2000, uh, she was, for her contribution and leadership in the field of uh, ADF av Aviation Inventory <coughs> Management, she was recognised with the Conspicuous Service Cross. She was also the Chief of Air Force Advisory Committee. Recently she joined Quintech Australia a, as two, in 2007 as a non-executive director. Welcome Margaret. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to participate in this panel as part of the University of uh, Melbourne Science Festival in National Science Week. And can I say it's a great privilege to join my fellow uh, panellists uh, to look at those uh, game changers and change makers in the field of science, technology, engineering and maths, or STEM. In 2016, the government released the Defence White Paper outlining a strategic plan for the Australian Defence Force over the following decade. The paper describes the need for improvement in the capabilities of the ADF and includes a commitment of $195 billion of your taxpayers' money in spending on new equipment and resources. The capability of the Defence Force must be at the leading edge. But to remain at the leading edge, Australia will increasingly rely on a diverse workforce both in defence and defence industry with people with necessary skills and qualifications. And that's why um, uh, Defence has launched the Defence Industry Skilling and uh, Science, Technology, Engineering and Maths um, Strategy. The opportunities for women in this space are enormous. And that's why I wanted to focus on Defence and Defence Industry during my presentation. We've come a long way we have women on our journey, and uh, that's really quite sad that that um, was said. Going a little, unfortunately, closer to home, if young women were allowed to undertake tertiary education, the energy needed by the uterus would be diverted to the brain, <laughs> rendering them infertile. So in, in my short presentation, I just want to um, cover a little brief, brief history of women in defence. I am going to share my story as well. And I just really briefly want to touch on the opportunities today in the ADF defence industry and the next frontier space. So in terms of the uh, history of women uh, in the military, we go back a very long way in terms of um, even so far as back as the Boer War which is really a quite extraordinary commitment for women and talk about game changing. Since then, we've seen people, uh, women involved in many other areas of the ADF. There are currently over 8,500 women in the ADF, which represents about 17% of the workforce, with all categories of employment open to women. Women can be pilots, ship officers, and a uh, historic change in policy from 2013 now see women allowed in the combat arms of the army. Women now hold senior appointments and serve in key leadership roles on operations and in support roles in Australia and overseas. And in the finest tradition of our ANZACs, it is important to note that women that have given over a century of service, as you can see from this picture. 
Women in the Australian military can be traced back as far as 1899, when the first army nurses served in the Boer War, as I mentioned. Um, but in World War II, that's when it gave more women more employment opportunities, as you can see here in the maintenance side of things, as the men were sent overseas. And it was due to a shortage of uh, males that led to the formation of the women's services during World War II. It was not until 1969 that marriage didn't automatically mean discharge from the services for women. And it wasn't until 1974 that pregnancy did not draw the same fate. A year later, women were allowed to serve on active service, but not in combat roles. In 1977, the WAF was established and females integrated into the mainstream Air Force. Two years later, women were given equal pay and the Women's Royal Australian Army Corps was abolished and amalgamated into the mainstream army. It was in the 1980s that saw even greater change for women of the ADF. By 1984, 23.5% of positions were open to women in competition with men. The Navy permitted RAN officers to compete, uh, full training complete full training courses, and also saw the, the RANs appointed their first female commanding officer in 1988. By 1989, 43% of positions were open to women in competition with men. It was in 1990 that the Navy agreed that women could serve in combat-related positions and three RAF female pilots were employed in combat-related roles. A year later, Navy permitted women to serve on board Collins-class submarines. So you can see that over the years, the uh, slow progression for women participation in the ADF. And of course, more recently, and as I'm, some of the photos that I'm showing, uh, women have been deployed on all ADF operations from Cambodia, Rwanda, Somalia, East Timor, Bougainville, the Gulf, Solomon Islands, Iraq and Afghanistan. And of course, they continue to serve in the Middle East today. And these, these images just show a number of the different roles that our women are serving today. So let me turn to my story. So we've come a very long way, even since I joined the Air Force in 1981, when women couldn't be pilots. I couldn't be a pilot in the Air Force because I was a woman. I have deliberately used a photo earlier of a female military dog handler to share with you a story from my early days as a cadet officer. I remember asking a sergeant dog handler why there weren't female dog handlers and there weren't at that time. The answer was because, well, during menstruation, uh, if a woman handler was handling the dog, the dog would just go spare and couldn't be handled. We, we apparently believed that at the time. But the good news is we've moved on. So let me share a couple of pictures. That's my dad, he was in the Air Force. And I pay tribute to my dad, my late dad. He was of the school where he insisted on controlling my education. And I was absolutely determined to do arts, as you did, history and English. He insisted, demanded that I do English and uh, science and maths. And if I hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have been able to uh, apply for the course I ended up doing and joining the Air Force. So that's my connection to the STEM world and it continued throughout my career. And of course, I was able to graduate my undergraduate degree having uh, done my um, work in year 12. Perhaps my greatest um, achievement, I would have to say, are my twins. Um, they hate it when I put this photo up. But I also share this story because um, when I was seven weeks pregnant, um, my husband was killed in an aircraft accident. So um, I had to um, take that on board and continue on and eventually my wonderful twins came along. And it was a great lesson in life. My friends, my family and the Air Force supported me wholeheartedly in continuing my career. And if they hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have been able to uh, pursue my career in leadership. Some of the highlights of my career included an uh, exchange position in the Pentagon in the um, United States uh, Air Force. Interesting times, 2000 to 2002, if you want to talk about that later. 
Um, my, once again, my kids hate that when I do this. But um, fast forward, and they were there to um, celebrate my promotion to Air Commodore, which was really special. I was the commandant at the Australian Defence Force Academy. Very challenging time. I had two, te te two teenagers of my own and suddenly responsible uh, for 1,002. One of my proud moments when Her Excellency reviewed our parade on graduation after that year. I went on to become the uh, commander of uh, joint uh, logistics, in other words, in charge of logistics for the Australian Defence Force. And uh, I was over in Timor making sure that all our contractual support to our troops over there was working uh, as well as it might. And at the end of my career in the Air Force, we celebrate with families uh, because we know that the families are there to support us during that time. And it can be very demanding on families, uh, as we know. I went on to be the uh, CEO and Managing Director of Air Services Australia for three years, where we uh, look after all the air navigation uh, and air traffic control. So, believe it or not, the air traffickers don't try and create delays. <laughs> Sometimes the weather has something to do with that. Okay, just very briefly, I just want to say now the opportunities uh, today in the ADF. I put this photo up because in 1995, was when women were first allowed to be pilots in the Air Force. So after I had joined, uh, but it was not until 2017 we graduated our first uh, lady fighter pilots. A um, very significant moment for us in the Royal Australian Air Force. And the two pilots on the end, um, they're, they're our girls there. There are 200 job families in the ADF, covering all sorts of things. Uh, and many of them require science, technology, maths to be part of that. So I encourage you to think about a career in the Australian Defence Force. It's very rewarding, I can say that. But if that's not what you're interested in, in terms of um, supporting the Australian Defence Force, defence industry is um, just enormous. And um, our, our Minister for <laughs> Defence Industry uh, released this um, whole a campaign about women, sorry, the workforce behind the Defence Force and encouraging women to be part of that. Uh, really um, very important. And that's why I'm very uh, proud um, today to be here involved with uh, through the Kinetic Organisation because we have a vision to be the chosen partner around the world for mission critical solutions, innovating for our customers' advantage. We also contribute to and we rely on STEM diversity and advancement. And we, we are a global engineering, science and technology business of over 6,000 personnel and with a very proud heritage of long-term partnering and collaboration to solve customer problems. And if that doesn't float your boat, can I say that the next frontier is space? And it's really exciting. Um, and, and I talk about space because we need space to support the ADF, but also for Australia. And one of the exciting things about uh, space this year was our first head of the Australian uh, Space Agency, a lady, Dr Megan Clark, is pursuing that goal to make sure that Australia has a competitive global space industry. So that's the challenge. So ladies and gentlemen, um, before I conclude, I would argue that women are the very essence of what we need going forward for Australia's national security and prosperity. This is said in the belief that the outlook is very complex, uncertain and unprecedented, and I think women thrive in that environment. Like many other professions, we have come a very long way, as I hope I've de demonstrated, from the initial service of our brave nurses in the Boer War to the operational service that many of our women have seen even as we speak at this moment. I hope I have left you with a sense of opportunity for our young women who may wish to serve their nation in the profession of arms. The future leadership of the ADF requires that our leaders are trained and educated to embrace an adaptive style of leadership and the technologies and innovations we surely need going into the future. I hope you too will become part of the growing force of women game changers and change makers for our nation. And can I leave you with a quote from one of the game changers and change makers in aviation, Amelia Earhart, who was the first female aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. And she said, 
The most difficult thing is the decision to act. The rest is merely tenacity. The fears of paper tigers. You can do anything you decide to do. You can act to change and control your life. And the procedure and the process itself is its own reward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret, for another really inspiring presentation. And I think you've shown us that all three presentations, a really wide range of women who are doing amazing things in science and inspirational, game-changing women. But we want more. Uh, we, we, we agree, we want more. So we're going to have a panel now and we're going to discuss uh, some of the issues about increasing the presentation of women in uh, STEM. So I'd like to invite uh, the women up to uh, join the panel. Do we need to mic people? No? Okay, I might start just with another example um, um, where I found it very helpful to uh, work on the participation rate and encouraging uh, girls to think about um, uh, their, their future in STEM. So when I was Commandant at ADFA, one of the things I did was go out to um, high schools, um, particularly the girls' schools, and take recent graduates, uh, lady graduates from ADFA. And we had one particular occasion I can remember where we had an air combat officer who turned up in her flying suit to her school where she graduated from two years earlier. And it was an absolute classic because people were saying, Mary, is that you? <laughs> and, and basically what it showed me was that the girls at the school had no comprehension that they could actually do that until they actually saw Mary, that's not her real name, but um, this, this wonderful uh, air combat officer who had just about com completed her training, and she said, yes, of course you can. You can be an air combat officer. You just have to make sure you pass your maths and science in high school, and you too could be this. So it's all about showing people what's possible, showing the girls what's possible, and making sure the influences in their life, like teachers, careers advisors, also know what uh, is possible because sometimes they're also uh, working from their own experience which unfortunately can be a little bit narrow. Thanks for that Margaret. I, I concur absolutely with what you're saying and, and Air 4 is really about trying to get that series of mentors from our tertiary students working with our secondary students who will work with our primary school students. I think the one thing that we really need to work on is our influences of our children and I spend a lot of time in the schoolyard and let me tell you people still think lawyers and doctors is where it's at whereas we both know that if you're an engineer and want to work in defence you have a job for life. If you're a software scientist, you will have a job for life. So I think we need to recontextualise really what's... What we need to let people know what STEM is. If you walked into the schoolyard and said, how good are you at STEM? People wouldn't know what you're talking about. So we need to demystify what really for the uninitiated, for the unwashed, what STEM is. And we need the grandparents and the parents really to go, oh, really? Could my child get a really good career and get highly paid from that? Cyber security specialist, just putting it out there. <laughs> So there's, there's also a couple of things you can do in your own lives that will make a difference. And the first is, if you ever do have children, think about the toys that you give them. There's a really great range of educational toys now that are for both sexes. Or why do you make, you know, gender 
um, differences in the toys that you give them. So take those personal choices and think carefully about it. But even you now as students, I'm assuming a lot of you are already studying science, engineering, maths or some type of technology. Pick a program and be one of those mentors. You know, the person that has, them, has an influence on younger kids, they're going to look up to you because you're even closer to their age. They can imagine themselves as you. It's, by the time you get to our age, it's a little bit hard for the kids <laughs> in primary school to imagine themselves as us. So participate in one of those programs. CSIRO has one. We just heard about Air 4. Um, reach out and volunteer some of your time. It's the most valuable thing you have. Okay. Um, let's maybe do take a slightly different tack, track. Oh, don't be tack, never mind. <laughs> um, have, have you ever felt that it was harder to be a woman in STEM than a man in your individual careers? Um, and if so, how did you overcome it? We want some, we want some stories here. <laughs> I don't think that you warned us about that question. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, certainly, um, when people ask me what the most important thing that you can do to succeed in a career in STEM, it actually is to build your resilience. I started out when I was young uh, as a young mum, so I had a, a bigger helping than um, many of you might in the way that you're disadvantaged in the workplace. So um, I wasn't very resilient to begin with. It was something I built over the time and I continue to build, you know is that comment directed at me? Do they mean it in that way or am I layering my own gender identity over that situation? So they're the types of things that I, I, I still do to this day to build that resilience. I think um, I, I look back over my career, particularly in the Air Force, and in my uh, junior years, uh, years, I didn't really notice that I, I mean, I was in workforces where there were hardly any women. I mean, that goes without saying. But actually, it wasn't until it, the, I reached the senior, senior ranks where I noticed being the only woman in the senior committees that suddenly, you know, I, I would ask a question and I'd get this. And then I'd think, oh, gosh, what planet am I from? <laughs> and uh, so it was at that point I realised that it's really important to speak up and... Um, raise the issue that you know there is a difference and we do think differently and in fact that's why we want gen gender diversity because we want that innovative thinking. I remember saying once to um, CDF, Chief of the Defence Force, with all due respect sir, and you always say that before you <laughs> say something of, uh, critical, I said sir you know I really respect you and I think you're wonderful etc etc but you know what I don't want to be exactly like you and no one had ever actually said that to him. So I think sometimes you've got to be forward in saying that there is a difference and uh, that's what we want to celebrate. I need a job tomorrow, so I'm going to be careful what I say here. Um, look, I, I think there is no doubt that even today, men and women are treated differently in the workplace. There is wonderful programs out there to try and, and make that gender blurred in those lines, but it still exists. And so don't go out there that thinks it's Nirvana because all these wonderful programs are out there, but I would surround yourself by really positive role models. I have a cohort of women who have just taken me under their wing. I, they are lawyers, they're, they're actors, they're all sorts of very different people. And the people I can ring up and have a genuine conversation, they don't just pat you on the back going, it's all right, darling, of course you're right, of course you're right. They're the ones that balance it and go, well, what were you thinking saying that? Of course they're right in telling you to do that. You know, and you're like, oh, really? So it's a bit like that. You need someone to balance. And I think my um, advice would be to surround yourself by positive people who are going to tell you the truth. And just accept that sometimes you're going to have adversity, but you need to get through it. So that maybe leads me to uh, a related question. If you had a word of advice for a young woman going into a field of STEM, what, what would that be? Or maybe a couple of words of advice. You've got more than one. Work on you. The workplace, it might be challenging. The environment, it might be not be diverse. But if you bring your best self to that environment and, 
and you've developed yourself to the extent that you can, you will be able to navigate a path. So really focus, especially during your formative university years of getting the most out of your education. That would be the advice that I would give. Look, I would amplify that. I think authenticity is absolutely crucial um, because if you're trying to be somebody you're not, uh, you'll have all sorts of troubles um, going through that. Um, perhaps the other thing is to um, make sure that you've got a group of friends that you can rely on and ask you know, for help. Don't feel like you have to do everything by yourself and, and be Wonder Woman and, and um, you know, think that you can solve everything by yourself. Having a great uh, group of friends and ask for help is um, really important. I think I gave you mine, but I'll give you one other little piece of advice. And I think that is maintain your female identity. One of the things that's terribly wrong uh, in one of the areas that I've been in, which is future studies and looking at what the future looks like, is we have, and I'm, I'm going to offend a few of the audience, the middle-aged white man syndrome. <laughs> because when we ask people what the future looks like up until very recently, it's all been about those senior leadership people who unfortunately have been of that demographic. So maintaining, your, I think that maintaining your identity, your authenticity and who you are is actually going to be beneficial for our industry going forward. So I also wanted to point out that we didn't get to be who we are overnight. Um, it's a long, long time of building, building your reputation, building your knowledge, building your network. Um, we also all showed our kids. Now, I know that I didn't have a meteoric rise while I was focusing on them and that um, there are times where... I'm also 100% focused on work and rely on my family and the village that I've created to support my family. So understanding that behind every woman that is put up on this pedestal, there is a real life, there are real people just like you, and trying to see through that mask that we all portray, that it's easy and we're superwomen and we can do it all, that there's actually pathways that are achievable if you take it one step at a time. I think that's so insightful. I mean, everyone wants to feel like you go and get pirate costumes when they're dressed up day. Or, or fail and send your kid to school in their uniform. <laughs> you know, those are the two choices. Um, I think at this point we might throw to the audience. Have we got any... Oh, brilliant. Uh, do we have the roving mics? Well done, first of all, to the organizers of this event. My name is Molly. I'm from Victoria University, and I'm the co-founder of Women in Science and Engineering, VicUni. So my question is, one of the problems we found in engineering, especially in engineering for um, most female students, is for first-year students, when they come in, some of them tend to drop out of like engineering before they get to second year or third year. I don't know if that's a problem in Melbourne Uni, but in VU, it's been a problem in the past couple of years. I'm actually doing my PhD. And that was one of my motivations in starting WISE, to actually have a community where female students could come together and have um, a space where we are allowed to be ourselves. Because you get into a classroom and you're maybe one of 10 you could actually count the percentage of females. So um, one of the things that surrounded this is because most females, they feel like they have to choose between their career and family. And I've listened to every one of you, and you guys have done so wonderfully well in combining both. So I just want to ask, like, was that like a challenge? And what would you say to that young girl thinking, am I going to be able to pursue a career in STEM and get to that level where you guys have found yourself and combine it with family as well. Thank you. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, and I'll quote one of my um, absolute, you know, people I admire greatly, and I had a photo up there, uh, Her Excellency Quentin Bryce, 
where she famously said, of course you can have everything, but perhaps not all at the same time. And uh, that's building on what Danielle said. Sometimes you just have to, um, you know, uh, take a, a break from work, um, take a break from study if uh, you need to focus on your family. Um, it's not either or. You can do both. But the other thing is, and I absolutely... One of the lessons I learned as a senior officer it, too late was that I was making it look easy. I didn't mean to, but I just got on and did everything. And then I had people looking up at me thinking... I can't do that. And what I wasn't doing was sharing how bloody hard it is. And so um, I think we, we have to be honest about that and say, well, it's not going to be easy. Um, it's very rewarding, uh, but it's not easy. And, um, okay, if you accept that, that's when you need to rely on family, friends, um, knowing yourself really well to know that you're not overstretching yourself um, sometimes, like I, talk, working with some of the women in my previous organisation, they'd say, oh, we're, we're exhausted. And I said, what are you doing? Well, I've got three kids, I've got a middle management, I'm um, just doing three subjects of my MBA and I'm looking after my older mum. And it's like, well, for heaven's sake, let's start. Drop two subjects of the MBA. Do, you know, you've got to start being practical about how much you can do because you'll just break yourself or you'll drop out of class and that's not what we want. Um, yeah, just building on that, I absolutely agree. Um, and it's about not feeling guilty and going at the speed that you go at. Um, a lot of people put guilt on themselves, guilt because they use childcare, guilt because they're not a stay-at-home parent, guilt because X, Y, Z. And releasing that guilt and knowing that there's love in your family and that will get you by no matter, no matter what. We'll take another question, I think, John. Oh, okay. Brilliant. Hi, uh, my name is Leah. I work for an engineering and advisory company called Oricon. Uh, we've talked a lot about how we can get young people, young females engaged in STEM and interested in STEM, but I was wondering if you could, if you have any views on how we can get um, females that are already working in STEM to take up leadership positions? Um, that's something that I spend quite a lot of my time thinking about because I think it is really difficult and it's, it's the old age um, drama, isn't it, that females notoriously don't put themselves up for promotion because we need to have overachieved before we're ready. And um, I'll give you my story at the moment. I've just been working um, as the Associate Director of the Defence Science Institute and I had the most wonderful time and I was surrounded by very senior um, men and women who really came to me and said, you, you need to go and find something more with what you can do. And I'm like, no, no, I'm right. No, no, you really do need to. And they said it so many times, I thought, oh, maybe I need to actually. So um, I've just taken on an associate dean's position, which I would never have suggested I would do, but because other people believed in me. And I think we as a community need to start to get our really senior females and start to say, you really need to do better because we need to be underachieving. And the other thing to, to be where we are, right? The other thing that, that I've been not for is the quota system. But I saw a fantastic interview the other day that said the men have had a 100% quota for centuries. <laughs> it's about time that we ask for just 50%. And I think that's something that maybe we really do need to look at on all boards in all organisations. Can I commend to you the work that uh, is being done by the male Champions of Change? which was set up by Elizabeth Broderick when she was still um, the um, Sex Discrimination Commissioner. And that was about saying, OK, the lack of women in senior leadership uh, roles is not a woman's issue. And it's about the leadership of companies taking on board um, the need to um, identify what are the barriers and create the opportunities for women and supporting women and then mentoring and challenging women um, and it is very much like I've had a couple of times in my career where, you know, I've had someone say, you, you really ought to apply for this. 
oh, I don't think I can do that. Oh, yes, you can, you know. And, and it really, that's what we need. So those, and if you look on their website, there, there's a, a raft of um, things that these companies are doing now to make sure that women are competitive. So I actually, for you know what it's worth, I do believe in quotas now. I never used to, um, because I think we're going backwards. But it's about not. Ha you, you, we need to create the environment for women to be competitive, to win these roles um, in their own right. But we need some other structures in place to make that happen. I, I couldn't agree more. Agree with quotas. <laughs> agree with active sponsorship of not just women, but but all. Um, all of your staff um, because people are not likely to put themselves forward actually people have been sponsoring each other for centuries and the one extra thing I would say is I'm a big proponent of flexible working conditions for everyone and normalizing flexible working conditions for every um, person in your organization or company because the minute that um, the father can take the same leave to care for their child, then it's a discussion between that family about who can take that role on or who wants to take that role on and it's normalised and it's not a gender issue anymore. So um, I'm really proud to say that CSIRO has taken that step where flexible is the default answer um, for everyone as they walk in the door and we have the burden of proof is then on the organisation. Well, why can't you do that job flexibly rather than the other way around? And it's for everyone, irrespective of your stage in life. And so I think that's a really good step that more companies and businesses could take on. Hi, my name is Scala, and I'm a Melbourne Uni alumni. And um, I guess I'm hearing a lot of talk about flexibility and having worked in industry, I've found flexibility to be one of the main reasons why I can at least try and do a lot of different things. Um, I can be involved in a lot of things that aren't necessarily standard. And I guess as a, as a student here, I actually found the opposite, like um, flexibility was questioned. And in particular, like just recently, I know PhD students, for example, have to finish in four years. You know, if you get pregnant halfway, that seems exactly the opposite of support um, for flexibility. And um, I found a lot of lecturers, for example, didn't want some of the notes to be on the lecture capture because then students wouldn't come to class. And how do you address with people in power? Because at least in the math department, there was a lot of people in power. How do you address this, how that hurts you yeah, that's without, um, without upsetting and then blocking yourself? It's a, re it's a really good question. And um, I'm going to draw on some personal examples. So obviously you saw I had two children throughout my studies. Um, the first thing was just to talk to people about your issue. So I needed to take leave. I was going to have a baby. I went, you know, the, the person in my faculty, my school wasn't very supportive. That was my experience too. But then I went to their boss and to their boss until I found someone who was willing to accept that this was something that I was going to continue with and help me. So don't get no, let, don't let no be an answer if you feel that you have a right to better treatment. Um, the next thing is make sure, like with my PhD, I obviously got an extension from those four years. I had five and I asked for it. It was an arrangement that I had with the school. Um, they didn't get funding for my last two years and the school did that for me because I had a child. Um, it, it was something that we negotiated. Now, again, if I hadn't have had that supportive environment, I wouldn't have chosen that group to work in. So I chose my field of study not because I wanted to do that niche but because I knew it was a place that I would be supported and succeed. So there might be other places, other institutions, sorry, Melbourne University, if this is a problem, I think the academics in the audience should follow up with you perhaps after this and see if they can help you. Yes. <laughs> 
Karen Van Sacker, I work for the University of Melbourne in the non-academic role. My question is, you, you didn't, the school didn't get funded for, for the last two years, but that's a federal government policy. And so what can we do to change federal government policy? Because that's where the pressure comes from to finish in the three and a half years. I would just say, yes, perhaps that's where the funding pressure comes from, but the university could make a choice to make a loss on special cases. And that's what happened in my case. Sorry, I was just going to say, and it comes back to that board position, uh, equity position, that I think is really fundamental. If we really want to make policy changes, we need women to take up leader posi leadership positions in influential areas that can, when these things do come to the, you know, to the front, half of the people sitting around the board table go, well, of course that's how it is. Why wouldn't it be that? Of course we need this. But until we get women to start to take board positions and have a real true voice in how the leadership uh, changes in policy, we're still going to be behind the eight ball. maybe times or experiences that um, that women were not supportive of you and also could you comment on maybe the issues of race or discriminations that are not about gender within your experience in terms of like I, I think there's always um, I, th I appreciate the panel's um, diversity on lots of different levels but I would like some kind of comment on that? I, I can share, um, I, I won't go into details, but um, I can share um, a recent example where I um, was shocked <laughs> that where, where I did not have the support of a couple of female board members and indeed um, uh, it wasn't lack of support, it was actual um, deliberate undermining and I just it was just so, um, I, to, the, to this day I don't understand it and I, I just didn't think it happened, but it does. So, um, and, and we, we, we could all do PhDs into why that is so, but so my, my response to that is, um, it's so, and I've heard this before and I try to do it now myself, we now, we, we women need to reach out and support other women. Um, I, I've heard throughout my career, well, I got here by myself. Why do I need? Why should I be helping anybody else to get there? I just think that's so mean-spirited, and um, it's just I, I don't understand that. So, so I think the first thing there is yes, we have to acknowledge that, and, and once again, I don't understand it. Um, to, to the issue of race, um, you, you can extend that to anyone who is feeling different. Um, I think that's, you know, when it comes down to it, you feel different in, in, in a group. Um, I think we just need to be um, very vigilant and um, hypersensitive to that. And I, I don't mean hypersensitive in a pejorative way. I mean, we need to understand that that is the way it is. Um, th there's a book, um, I just try, it's called The Loudest Duck, and it's by Susan, I can't think of a surname, but. Um, um, from America. Anyway, she talks about the Noah's Ark of um, diversity um, and it's a trap that we can fall into which is, well, I've got two women, I've got two Asians, I've got two Indigenous people, I've got two, therefore I've got the game scun on diversity. Well, if, if you're just playing a numbers game, you've forgotten the whole point of it and um, it's about encouraging uh, different thought, uh, bringing, and, and a lot of that comes from um, different backgrounds, and that's where you're going to get this innovation and, and creation um, and, the, and embracing technology that this country needs. And um, we need to keep talking about that because people don't understand that. And it's not just a numbers game, and it's not just about being politically correct. There's a higher purpose to this. And it's the classic cliche, I guess, but it's, you know, we can be far more the sum of the whole. 
with everybody who's um, different being included. Um, I'd, I'd just like to add, it's interesting, you know, we all, all talk about the sisterhood and, and I think we're all very um, big advocates for it here. But there are good females and bad females and, you know, we're, we're all human. So throughout my career, I mean, obviously there have been females that I don't gravitate towards. I just don't choose to take their energy into my space. I'm like everyone here, I'm incredibly busy trying to do everything else that people who, who want to stop me in doing things, I just don't care about and I will remove them from my sphere and try and get my way around them without um, losing myself in that. And one of the things, and the other bit about your diversity, and I think, you know, it's about gender today, but really this whole thing and, and for the Australian economy to be better, we need diversity of everything in our ecosystem, our industry, and it's really important that we stop looking at people as Asian or Indigenous or white, and I do notice we're now, now that I think about it, because I don't look at that, we are all white. It's about us saying, if you're the best person for the job, regardless of who you are, then we want you. And we want you to then go back to your community, your families, and tell them how good it is to be in STEM or history or whatever lived experience you have. And the more we do that as a community, the better off we're going to be. Um, sure. Um, there's Diversity isn't just about fairness either. There's actual studies, double blind studies now that show that boards who are diverse produce better financial results, that teams that are diverse, and I mean diversity of thought, um, thinking about the problem from different angles, create the outcome in a faster, cheaper, more effective way. So those studies now exist. And um, the final thing I would say is we a very valuable thing for me in shaping my perspective has been a program that we've had access to which is looking through their eyes and understanding culture of the staff that you have in your team will lead to better inclusion and incorporation in the way that you work as a team. And so it will also encourage you to think about those types of programs alongside your gender diversity programs to assist with that particular issue. Okay, well, I think we've I've run out of time. That was a great lot of questions and really made us think and kept the panel on their toes. So thank you, ladies, for doing an amazing job. And Uh, please join me in, in thanking our facilitator for the evening, Dr Georgina Such, and our inspirational speakers. Uh, I, I've, I had a couple of notes here to talk about um, Kinetic, the, uh, the business in Australia that I'm fortunate enough to, to run, but I'll, I'll leave that. If you want to find out about Kinetic, uh, you, can, you can Google us. Just check how to spell it. Uh, it <laughs> Two Qs, no Us. It takes you a little while to get it. Uh, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things from the, uh, the presentations tonight because I thought they were, were really exceptional. Uh, Danielle, you know, the story of, uh, of Rosalind Franklin um, you know, was kind of fascinating and, and for her to be able to uh, go through that and come out the other end and say we stand on each other's shoulders was, was something you know, really rising above in a different way. Um, Regina, you know, your quote up there, you've got, to, you've got to see it to be it. Well, uh, I think uh, in the uh, four people that we've got here tonight, we've certainly seen people who are uh, very successful in their own right, very inspirational and all uh, going on to do bigger and better things. So thank you for that. Uh, and, and Margie, um, you know, your story uh, about the impact your father had was, was quite touching to me. You know, I've got two young girls and I truly hope that I can do something as meaningful for them. Uh, the thing that I just wanted to finish on, though, was I think the, probably the best advice of all from my perspective and relevant to, to everyone in the room here tonight was something from, um, that Danielle said, which was, whatever you're doing, bring your best self to it. So thank you for that. So thanks once again to all of you.